this is the TC workshop. Uh, I'm the chair. These folks are going to say something during this uh, uh, session. Hello. Say hello to the crowd. <laughs> We're not going to be as exciting as Dave, but. And it's not the. It's not as exciting as the net de uh, as the performance workshop. What is that called? The death march. <laughs> but we have Mellanox and Intel here, so the. But uh, Mellanox is overshadowing Intel. <laughs> and we have other fair representation. Uh, and XP. So do you want to quickly just say who you are? Madeline. Madeline. I'm from working for NXP. Use the mic, please, because it's being recorded. Used to be Freescale. Next. You may not that. Uh, Lucas. Yep. Hello. Uh, next. Uh, yes. I'm Leo from Mellanox. Iran from Mellanox. Roni from Mellanox. Jiri from Mellanox. See, I, I told you the, the, over, the, the Intel guys over, overmatched. Uh, Kiran Patil from Intel. I'm um, Roman from Mojo Tattoo. Okay, so we'll get started. So we have a very, very, very tight agenda. So first thing is we'll do a very quick coverage of since NetDev 2.1, what new offloads or new offload features have shown up in different uh, vendor chips. We have a section on performance, and then we'll talk about new features, and this have nothing, that have nothing to do with offloading, as well as requirements, requests, improvements. And last, if we have time, Lucas will update us on the test. So I'm going to start the first session with Yuri. Uh, if you want to go with Yuri, I will F5. Here you go. So Yuri is going to. Uh, you. Here. Yuri is going to talk about the Mellanox uh, switching chip. We have a box here uh, that we can demo if someone's excited afterwards. Yeah, okay. This is just a quick update uh, about what we did in MLXS W driver, that's driver for Mellanox Spectrum ASIC. Uh, we support uh, uh, cl flower classifier, uh, and we uh, offload the rules uh, to the TCAM we have. Uh, we support so far just the basic keys and basic uh, actions, like uh, mirror uh, redirect, uh, VLA modify, and drop. And we have some, uh, well, the TCAM is not, not optimally utilized because we lack multi-table support in TC. That's what I'm going to talk about later on. And uh, also we need to somehow hint, hint the driver so we, it can uh, prepare the TCAM regions so the key widths are what they are expected to be so they don't, uh, uh, so, so we can fit more rules into TCAM re uh, regions basically. Oh yeah, this is, this is uh, my colleague, uh, Yotam Gigi, he, he implemented packet sampling. <coughs> so basically what he did, he, he uh, introduced a new uh, interface uh, based on generic netlink, which is used for uh, pushing the packets to the user space. Originally this, is, uh, this has been done by Anaflo, but Anaflo is uh, specific to Netfilter, and we wanted something more generic. Uh, Uh, he also implemented TC action, uh, sample TC action, which uses uh, this interface to uh, push uh, packets to, to user space. So you can see an example of usage, and this is also uh, offloaded in MLX SW uh, spectrum switch. Yeah, that's is an example. That's How? the example. So it's using classify called match all, matches everything. Yeah, and then it. Action, what it samples, what, what is the rate there? That's 12 every 12 seconds? No. Uh, uh. Every 12th packet? I, every, I don't know. every 12th packet, okay. And since it's a group 13? Yeah, that's, that you can, you can have multiple groups. And uh, so in user space, you can actually know what group it comes from. What okay, so it's it, connected it, to the it, group. it gets tagged when it hits user space, so you know which group it is. Yep. Okay. Mike, uh, there's a mic here. I think the question is, could you elaborate on what the group means? Yes. Yeah. So, <coughs> is, is, is yeah. Something that you are getting as a hint for the hardware, or is it? Well, the, you, you define the group um, when you 
insert a rule, you say which group it should come to, and in the user space you see uh, the sam sample buckets coming in with the, with the group ID, so we can actually distinguish from which rule it came. Basically, that's it. Uh, because it, the, the, the channels are not, it, it's not the same channel. You're using uh, TC, RT Netlink to insert the rule, mm -hmm. and the sample packets are coming through completely different channel to right. generic Netlink P sample channel. So you have to pair it. That's okay. basically it. Okay. Yep. Just keep the mic there. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't think I have any. All right. That's, that's another. Okay, so this is the new features, or should we? we I think we're going to leave it. This is new features. Okay, yeah. we'll leave it to them. Okay, so next I'm going to have Ronnie come up. Ronnie. Uh, your slides, I believe. No. Nope. Trying to find the slides. Should be cute. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm just. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, we're working on TC. Uh, to, to implement it, uh, things for OpenVis, which offloads and does other kind of stuff. Um, and we're now adding uh, the option uh, to header rewrite the traffic. Um, so what the reason we do need to have uh, rewrite the headers? So the basic thing is to support a kind of routing, a distributed virtual router that's used for uh, OpenStack. Uh, you also can implement it a kind of a NAT just the multiple, uh, changing the uh, IP addresses and the uh, ports. Um, of course, you can do that while you're doing routing. And you can do a lot of other things that you can, you can imagine. OK. Um, OK, so what is the, the uh, how you can do that? Uh, the action that is called is already was a long time, time ago, I think, Jamal, when he edited? Yes, I didn't know anybody was going to use it for this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we are doing it. Yes. Uh, so there is a, a TC action that is called pedit, packet edit. Um, the pedit action contains a set of keys, each uh, defining a rewrite element. Each key has a kind of uh, offset, a mask, and a value that you want to change. The offset is is used in order to say which field that you want to say. And uh, the legacy fields not explain, uh, okay, and other fields, of course, uh, and all are 32 bits. The offset mask value define byte offset, that's use, usually used in TC. Uh, that is uh, where it's in the packet, starting from the IP address, where do you want to, to make the change? So it's not have a, a notion of a field, so you can't say explicitly, I want to change the, um, the UDP ports. Um, okay. Uh, of course, this is the kernel API. So... Next, yes. I don't know. I think it's uh, that one there. Yeah, this Yes, one. Yeah. okay. Uh, okay, so of course, what we decided to do, uh, of course, not trying to do the um, uh, to change the wheel of, and to do to use the same uh, uh, to reuse the p-edit, but uh, we want to to keep the same idea of offset mask and value. But the most issue that we faced that we didn't like that you need to say. How long, you, you cross about two few protocols. So if you want to change the, UD, the UDP port, you need to count how, if it's IPv4 or IPv6 packet. So it's not, infi, not efficient. So what we add, we add a, a header type. So you need to, to mention what header you're going to, uh, to change. And in the header, we still use the same idea of offset. So you can, if you want to change the TTL, or you to send a source IP address, you just need to mention IP and what is the offset inside the IP and what you want to do. Um, okay, the, the, the two actions that we are supporting is to set a value. Uh, 
So you want to change the IP address. This is the new IP address that you want. And another, way, another thing is to, to do um, to add a field. Like if you want to, to decrement the TTL, so you add 255, you get an overlap, and you, that's like decrementing the TTL by one. So all this code was uh, added by uh, Amir Vadai as part of uh, uh, it's merged in uh, kernel uh, 4.11. So you can already use it if you would like. You can try it at home. Is this connect x4.5 or? It's OK. Yeah. Um, Next, OK. OK, so before we go to our driver, we're talking generally. OK, it's fine. It's not related to Mellanox. Oh, this has nothing to do with Mellanox, the no? interface phase. OK. The interface is generic. Everybody right. can use it. Okay. And mm -hmm. all the drivers, we hope that all the drivers will support it. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. So when you use the protocol field over there, uh, you're assuming any packet that has IP in it. So it could be tunneled, non-tunneled. And that's how you want the hardware to treat it? So you need to mention what header you want to change, if it's an inner... No, you, you're mentioning the header. That header could be in an, an encapsulated packet or in an encapsulated packet. OK, so currently we, ta we started with, a plain, with the outer header. So we don't spoke about yet about encapsulated packet. That's but I mean, I will assume we keep that notion, right? So yes. It'll be good for the hardware if you keep the notion that when you say protocol IP, it means for any packet that has that IP header in it. No, the header could no, be no, no, louder. No, 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 you're missing. This is not the classification. Well, this is the editing. I, I think the first phase that he's saying if you classify, it's, you're already saying it's an IP, right? No, and you don't need to say it's IP. You can classify that if it's a TCP packet without right. uh, explaining that it's an IP, because it could be IPv4, IPv6. Yeah. You don't, but Use the mic, please, if you. Know. But this is related Someone to the classification. What you're talking is related yeah, to classification. No. It's actually We're related to both, and I, that's. Uh, well, no, so the point he's trying to make here is so it's filter IP. So that's the, the filter thing that's unrelated to. So the, the portion he's talking about right now is P edit, the actual editing of the packet itself. So the, the, the what is that? I'm trying to remember. It's, uh, it's, so it's an IP filter. I'm trying to remember. Is that just the name of the filter flower. type? Flower. Flower. Oh, it's flower. flower. Right. OK. Right. Well, yeah. right. But, but see, this, this is, yeah, well, protocol IP, that's just part of the basic TC infrastructure itself, if I recall, in terms of the setting up the filtering. Yeah, that part. And, and this action, so you, Ron so is talking, you, are you talking about this? this yeah, being so the, the head example office? here that you can see, we p-edit mangling uh, Ethernet destination. We set it to a specific MAC. And we edit the destination MAC, and we're decrementing the TTL. A classic routing uh, action. No, this this is really good, and this is you know useful for hardware. I'm I'm not denying that. I'm trying to understand the meaning for two things. One is hardware does some optimization uh, when you know doing the rules, so you want to group the rules together, right? Okay. right. And sometimes you want to be very specific. So you want the P edit to happen only on certain kind of packet maybe just an unencapsulated packet. OK, so that's the, the first part of the uh, filter. The flower that you classify what on which packet you want to do the editing. OK, OK. Yeah. I think so we do support the inner things when we do we, the action is done on a, on a VXLAN interface. But we didn't uh, complete it yet. We started with the basic stuff. With this one, the p-edit, you don't intend to do push and pop of headers, or you do? Uh, no. It's editing. It's not pushing. Yeah, this is pure editing. It's, you can do x or or yeah, ors but or uh, ands. As you, as you said, in, we, for, of course, we will need to, to extend it in order to push header. Because currently, the, the VXLAN is done differently. It's done using um, a device, a VXLAN device. That's why I was going. Like, if you're doing it through the device, um, that model is very different. And if we do it through the push pop action in TC, it'll be easier to do it. Yeah, I, th I think this, in this case, you have some new protocol, like GTP, for example, that you have no idea how to deal with. Then this is raw. It's like yeah. very assembler level. So you start, yeah. you're doing something, and then you write something better afterwards. Yeah. 
Okay, so in, the, in this example, as I mentioned, we see that we're classifying with the flower classifier whenever packet type that we want. Here, for example, is an IP protocol. Um, the magic word, skip software, um, it means that you're taking it into the hardware. And even you not specify the skip software, it means it's going to the hardware and to the software. But for the p-edit, I recommend do skip software. You don't want to, to struggle with, the, with it. Um, and uh, again, uh, what, what we are doing here is a kind of routing. We, send, we set the, IP, the source IP, uh, source mark, sorry, and the destination mark and decrementing the TTL. Um, the TC command itself looks very nice, but the net... The, um, looks nice? Yeah. yeah. V yeah. Very readable, yeah. Okay. No, I, 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 everybody raise a hand who can read that. Who can read this? Okay. Who can read it? Oh, every two people can read. Uh, only okay. Shri only Shrijit can now read. Now let's it. see uh, how people can read <laughs> the netlink. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the net netlink yeah. is less nice, as I mentioned before. Yeah. The netlink itself contains offsets and not like move the TTL, the, uh, uh, mangling the TTL. By the way, PEdit does have human-friendly interfaces, like yes. you can say IPv4 and it will write this stuff for you. Only but when I you... I never use it. Yes. Okay. Okay, yeah. but when you do the show, yeah. we get it... What in raw, in raw, in raw format, yes. What you send to the kernel, so this is not obvious because usually yeah. customer that's... But there, there's some ideas where we could actually, yeah, now that we, we have we, cookies, we could actually put the cookie and use the cookie to interpret things. Right. But go ahead, so, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so here you can show, you can see how the show command is look like. So you man we're changing the IP, the, um, the Ethernet plus zero. It means the source MAC, uh, the DMAC, sorry. Um, of course, is this, uh, as we spoke before, it's a 32-bit. So this is two actions for the source, for the destination MAC. And then two fields from offset four and offset, on offset eight to change the, the source, MAC, source MAC and plus eight. Uh, through the IP header to change the TTL. Any question? Uh, the show command has order one. Is that uh, the table? That's, no, that's, uh, that's essentially you could have a chain of actions. Let's just say there's only one in this case, but I don't know if your hardware supports multiple actions in, in a pipeline. Okay. Then they'll be ordered in the way they're going to be executed. And, and as uh, Jamal said, uh, of course, we did it in order to support it in the ConnectX5. Um, so it is ConnectX5. I yes. didn't know. I, did. I was just curious because uh, so, yeah. I have a ConnectX4. So, so you buy one. <laughs> <laughs> we can give you a discount. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So this is supporting uh, from the ConnectX5 uh, hardware that use the same interface, uh, the ConnectX4 and the ConnectX5. Both of them work on the same driver, the MLX5 driver. So now we are aligned with the numbers. Um, okay, so what we're doing there, of course, uh, the driver is translating uh, the command, the header, the type, the offset, uh, into a hardware modify header. So we take it to the, our firmware. Uh, the, tr the translation uh, logics use the header plus type offset to, re to realize what field, if it's an Ethernet, a DMARC, a TTL, we are doing reverse for what uh, the user mm -hmm. was intent to. And, uh, and, to, and uh, of course, to, uh, to let the hardware parser uh, uh, do that. Um, I think, okay, yeah. so I think this is um, the most thing that we wanted to edit is for the uh, SROV environment. So we, when we do a hardware offload for a uh, TC, so we want to use for a virtual machine to do a router. So this is the main uh, reason that we edit. But it also can be done for non-switch environment. So if you want to do it as a NIC, so all the traffic that you, you're getting, you will get them uh, changed, uh, modif uh, rewriting, rewrited, and 
Uh, of course, uh, it's, the driver itself was uh, accepted in uh, 412. Is, it, is that the last slide? Oh. Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, I know this, based on what you asked, and I was talking to Simon at some point as well. This may not be, this is, I use Pedit, I guess I, I also wrote it, but I would not use this for things. Uh, like recently I used it to change MAC addresses. There was containers going out and the driver was broken. So, so somebody speaking? Right, so I, but I wouldn't use this sort of, uh, it's not human friendly as you can see. Uh, I know you say you can read that, but. Uh, it's a good starting point, and it's only for packet editing. You don't go and add extra headers on it or remove headers. I recently used it to edit our packets going out, so I could cheat the other guy. I think I'm coming from a different MAC address, right? But if that was a common use case, then I'll probably use SKB mod. So I, I think there's contention that this may not. This is a, this is how hardware works, but there may be better ways yes. for wrappers to write. So, so as I mentioned uh, earlier, the the main uh, reason we edit. We edited it is to support a kind of a switch for a, when you use an SRIOV uh, and you want to have a switch environment when you want to do a routing that's your uh, embedded switch is doing routing that's the way that's you're adding the rules you don't have to change the firmware to use this right so, so similar reason for u32 versus flower in flower every time we want to add a new field well I gotta go and call Ronnie or or to change some firmware for me uh, was with U32, I could write macros like this, right? Same thing for editing, this would be useful. Right. Right. Any comments, Simon? Mike, uh, why don't you use that mic? Pull, pull this one here. Right. Use this one here. Pull it. Oh, actually, this works too. Yeah, I think the, <coughs> the comment you raised about. Uh, <coughs> so, P edit is, is very generic. We can act. Within some limit limitation, if we can find, if we know the offset of something, we can modify it uh, in the packet data. So, if there's some new field we want to modify, so long as it has a stable offset, we can modify it without updating the various layers. We don't have to teach the Linux kernel about this, and if we're offloading it, we don't have to teach so the hardware about it either. But uh, the offset calculation is actually the weakness in PEdit, from my point of view. Because, okay. So because in in the for stack tags, uh, like say a large uh, a number of VLANs or IP options, uh, the calculating the offset is uh, right okay. because you don't know if the well you could actually classify. So my view is you could have two rules, yeah. one that classifies for and checks for IP options, calls the same kind of action, and the other one that assumes there's no IP options. Yes, so you need to have the same rule for IPv4 and IPv6. And IPv6. But consider like the, if you wanted to match on, on a specific field in a specific uh, option, like you wanted to get the fragment offset uh, from IPv6. Not that I do, but say you did. Um, <coughs> you, uh, how, and and there might be several options present in the packet, and you might have to, they could be in any order. Uh, this seems not well solved by Pieta, in my opinion. So what was your suggestion? Uh, that we develop a solution. <laughs> what, do you, what, what, what do you think of SKB mod as a... As yeah, a I, th I think SKB mod is, is, is uh, quite a lot nicer in this respect, is, but it suffers from the problem that you, you described, is that every time we wanted to do something new, we would have to teach yes. SKB mod about it. Oh, well, uh, how about you show up in NetDev 2? Two, two, is it 3? 2. Two, and tell us how we do it, or send patches or something. Yeah, like right. That. So um, yeah. I, I think uh, it comes back to the original statement about using something generic, using offsets, or using something uh, that you have to teach it every time you want to yes. do something new. If we could come up with some third way, I don't know what it is right now, but that, that's. Like I mean, I, I, I would have been happy to see Flower have a small extension which allows me to have arbitrary offsets lengths. Anyway, that's okay. side discussion. Uh, Alex, want to say something? It can be saved for the side discussion. Uh, can be saved for us for the penalty box. Well, yeah. If nothing else, okay. I just basically right. think we just do protocol so identification. Next, we, we're very tight on time. So next, I'm gonna have Iran. Uh, so Iran is uh, has a uh, a nice network processor that 
And uh, you, I don't know if you, I think you can use these. Okay. Uh, yeah. Or pull pull this one here because I want to pass this to. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll let him do the talking. And I'm going to present another uh, solution for uh, offloading of TC. This time uh -huh. on uh, Mellanox MPU. Okay. Uh, the Mellanox MPU is uh, called Indigo. So let's start. Uh, okay. First of all, we needed a name for the solution, the offload solution. We decided to call it Accelerated Traffic Control, ATC. Uh, pretty ambitious. And basically, it's the same functionality as uh, TC, but a bigger scale and performance. In this slide, you can see the box that uh, we developed uh, the solution on. The box has an uh, Intel uh, CPU, which is uh, responsible for all con control, configuration, management, and initialization of the Indigo platform, and also responsible for everything that happens inside the box. The Indigo platform itself also is, is uh, only responsible for the data pass. It runs the data pass only. So all traffic that uh, uh, in coming to the box itself is handled only by the, Indi the Indigo platform and not by the Intel CPU. Now, uh, an NPU, from whom of you who don't know what an NPU is, the idea is basically like a GPU. GPU is designed to optimize a graphic task. An NPU is designed for uh, optimization of network task, heavy network task. So this is our architectural vision. This is where uh, we are going, we are trying to achieve. This is our goal. We are not there yet. We are in uh, very early stages of uh, development. So currently, there is a PLC solution that uh, it's not exactly like this uh, figure, but uh, this is what we are aiming for. And the uh, right side of this slide, you can see the box that uh, I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, which has an Intel uh, processor. The Intel processor can uh, run Linux or any other network operation system. Uh, all commands go to the kernel, and the kernel is offloading the command using a new model, uh, the OpenNPU model in the kernel that uh, we are planning. The OpenNPU model uh, exposes a set of uh, high-level API for uh, development for the user to communicate with the uh, OpenNPU uh, NPS, the chip itself. So every developer that uh, wants to develop any data, pl data plane application and a networking application can use this uh, high-level API control. Can I, can I ask a question? So this, this is already in there? or No, it's not in so there. So these two pieces are not there today, but you, you'll have them. To the, well, this is the plan. Currently, right. they are in the user space. So NetDev 2.2, .2, we'll see this in there? If you invite me, I'll come. Yes. <laughs> OK. okay. Uh, so the NPS driver itself configures the OpenNPU. And uh, the OpenNPU, the Indigo platform, as you can see in the lower side of this uh, slide, uh, has also an SDK library called OpenNPU Data Plane API, which uh, enables the developer of uh, the data pass to effectively and easily uh, develop a new data plane application on top of the Indigo platform. Uh, so any custom data plane uh, or any third party commercial data plane application can be uh, developed easily using this uh, SDK. Also, Melnox uh, provides a set of middlewares for uh, SFT, DPI, crypto, that uh, also is part of the data part. That's, that that's, that's this part here? Yeah. Uh, sorry, this? This is the middleware. So yeah. the, I can go it's to GitHub and download this stuff? Yeah, you can. Or, or I have the, to call you? You have to call Melnox, probably. Have Send us an email to What's get on this GitHub right now? Is there any of this stuff in GitHub right now? I don't think it's open, uh, it's open source. Uh, most okay. of stuff. All right. Uh, the OpenNPU itself is the open source the SDK. And this the part is open source. Open source, yes. Right. And the but if I was to write IPsec offload. Yeah, it's not. Using uh, your. The NPS driver and the control API are also open source. OK. Um, this is one way of working with the NPS platform. Another way is uh, using remote uh, VNF to configure the chip itself, using uh, another set of uh, interface API in the user space that will communicate with the OpenNPU driver, control driver in the kernel. So uh, a brief introduction to the capabilities and features in the, uh, of the Indigo. 
uh, the network processor, the C programmable, which is a kind of revolution for a network processor. Until uh, recently, it was only using assembly uh, to write data plane application. It can uh, reach to ultra high 1400 gigabit throughput. You can uh, write data plane application up to layer seven. It uh, has an integrated hardware traffic management, variable, variable possible the network IOs, 10 gigabit internet, 40 gigabit internet, 100 gigabit. Uh, the network processor itself have uh, 256 set of cores. Each core has uh, 16 hardware threads, which basically enable 4K SMT threads. Uh, hardware acceleration is used uh, using ex hardware acceleration engines for uh, crypto. You can reach up to 100 gigabit per second of IPsec. <coughs> you can use it for DPI, TCAM, and uh, you have very, very large scale of DDR, 96 gigabit. You can define huge tables with uh, millions of millions of flows and states, and you can uh, write and update counters in wire speed performance. That's it for the introduction to the NPS. So how do we do the migration from uh, TC to the ATC? On the left side, you can see the standard TC running on a x86 uh, CPU with a NIC. So you have the management and configuration and the user space, and the Linux kernel does all the, w the hard work for the TC data plane processing. What we basically did, we did some kind of a trampoline mechanism to capture all the Netlink configuration. So what Ronnie said about how nasty the Netlink is for uh, some uh, actions, we have to deal with it. And uh, we open a socket and uh, open a new reflector daemon for ATC. The new socket uh, listens, uh, listens to all uh, Netlink messages for uh, TC, captures these messages, and uh, translate them to the NPS via the control driver, the easy CP, like it's uh, called here. And the NPS itself uh, does all the data pass application. All the hard work is done over there. So is this, what is this thing? So I can understand this, right? Someone that writes a TC rule, you go like that, install it, someone does a get. Yeah, everything is translated uh, using the reflection daemon right. to the tables of the data, the ATC data plane. Uh, right, and, and this is for querying only, or what? what, what is this? No, interface? this is the, actually the packet, this is what handles the, the packet itself, this is the packet processor. Okay, but should it not be sitting in here instead? It's residing on top of the okay. 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 okay, so just uh, for... Uh, All right to better understand the solution. Yeah. Okay, a little bit more detail. User space, user com, configure the IP route to TC, any routing command, any TC commands. Uh, we open the socket, listen all to all TC, FIB, and uh, ARP and Netlink commands, capture everything in the ITC daemon, and we translate uh, this command to our tables, to the new table that we define. Uh, and download it to the NPS uh, data pass, rewrite it uh, via uh, PCI. Uh, the ATC configuration block uh, have two blocks, the rules itself and the actions. And uh, we have a routing model that contains the FIB and the R. Also, uh, you can see here is the ingress side of the frame parser, validation, classification. And on the ingress side, we have transmission to network side or punting to host. All the green uh, blocks here are basically the OpenMPU data plane API, it's the SDK with, that we're using. And that's it. So what, uh, what did we implement? It? We, we wanted to reach a POC pretty quick, so we, we decided on a small feature set, minimum feature set, that uh, will uh, test our uh, platform to see the performance. So only ingress Q disk currently with flower filter. Flower filter is more human readable, is more easy to understand. The action that we support is a general action, all general action, okay, continue, reclassify, drop, etc. P edit, layered and row mode, and mirror redirection, egress only, uh, statistics and timestamp per action. Uh, and we cap the TC look and feel using the Netlink. So user can come, configure the 
regularly the TC commands. We listen to the TC commands, get the configuration, and download it. The, the goal was to reach 400 gigabit per second. And basically, we reached this performance with 400 bytes packet size. Uh, we tested it with a traffic generator connected to four ports of uh, 100 gigabit ports. And the configuration only for the testing was uh, uh, 1K filters per port, which each filter we had two actions. One action is pre-edit to do a modify of the IP and update the checksum. Uh, usually the checksum is not updated. You need, in the Linux, you need to have a special action that updates the checksum. But we wanted to, to be sure that we don't do any harm to the package itself in the modification process. So we did a checksum also. Mm -hmm. And we did the mirror redirect. We sent the packets back, loop back, back to the ports they came from. And statistic collection, timestamp per action. And this is the result. We started somewhere around the 300 gigabits. When, with some improvement to the code and some other uh, changes we did, we reached the 400 gigabit in the end. So I think this is a very cool feature here. That you, you, so you can add multiple actions or just, you can add multiple filters to the same action? Yeah. That's cool. You can I, don't, I don't know if any other hardware that can do this, that can, can have multiple filters pointing to the same action. You can? Yes. Connect X4 can do it? Okay. Yes. Uh, Intel? You can do it too? Are you just bragging or it's true? <laughs> okay. Okay. So the other thing that I think is very, what was the limitation? Why do you only have a thousand filters? No, it's, it's just uh, the testing. We, uh, we didn't want to go too high. We but can you, do, you, you can you, do millions. You can do millions and you'll still get the same rate. Yeah. Okay. I, I think we're kind of running out of time, but how? Um, so you promised to come back with an offloaded driver. Otherwise, these guys will kill me for giving you the spot. Okay. Right? Okay. Promise me? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, next on the schedule is, can I, can I have that? Okay. Madeline. Okay. Madeline, here you go. Thanks. Okay. Uh, <coughs> where it shows you is? Yes, I know I put it here. Uh, oh, it has, it has your name. Uh, yes. No, these are all. Get around. Okay, see. Okay. How about I, I have you, Kiran? Can you do yours first? And then uh, while I look for my. Yeah? You, you can go? Okay. Oh, you want to use that? Okay. Uh, okay. So, in the, some of the previous presentation, we saw the people, busy poll, application silos. So, <clears throat> this is a kind of taking the step, steps forward and see what are all the QoS feature we can have for some of these new features which are coming in. So. I'm sure everyone can understand the first command, which is uh, essentially we're trying to do here is we want to offload the MQ prio. That's where that HW2 is. Two stands for offload into the hardware. And uh, the, that 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 2, 3 is basically the priority to TC map. And the queues after that one is for each traffic class, how many queues and at what offset. So here the a uh, couple of uh, things we are thinking is basically an ability for the hardware to offload some of this information uh, using this uh, traffic class queues and the count. And the second one is, which is not highlighted, but that's something last minute I put together is, we would also like to see that if you can do some sort of rate limit for traffic class, and we can specify the min rate, and that will be like basically for each traffic class, what sort of rate limit we would like to have. And likewise, the max rate, so that's basically the one thing where user can configure and it can get offloaded into the hardware with a specific uh, rate limit. And uh, it can help essentially for the applications which are bound to specific uh, traffic classes. Then in the second step, once we said that up in the first step, we will say that uh, 
we would like to essentially extend the mirrored action instead of taking just the device name, the interface name, within that one a specific a traffic class. And uh, again, it will be only applicable and active in case of hardware offload only mode. So these are basically the two kind of, uh, uh, I call the QS related features, which we can have by extending or by modifying the TC MQ prior and having to add this uh, rate limit and the specific uh, mirrored action for a given traffic class. <coughs> Likewise, yeah. Can I can I ask you a question? Sorry, I'm still. Yeah. So you are trying to do something like HTB, but HTB likewise in hardware, and in then uh, but using the MQ prior yeah. Q disk. Uh, what does hardware number two mean? The HW two. Offload to hardware. That's so right now. Uh, offload to hardware. What is the tool? Well, mean? okay. It so just, I can yeah. probably explain that. Okay. So the existing um, uh, MQ prior configuration yeah. had this hardware value that was being passed that was an int that was being treated as a boolean. Um, I recently pushed changes in. So basically, we and so we'd always accept it as just okay. You wanted to do hardware offload on this, so we'll go ahead and offload it in hardware. But then when you'd go to check after the fact, it would just return one. So you could verify that, okay, yeah, I turned on the offload, but it's now telling me I got something completely different than what I passed. So I went and fixed that bit, so now basically, it more or less just locks in at one ex with existing behavior, but we should be able to extend that to treat that hardware field as either a version or a, uh, to specify a type of hardware offload, ideally, is what we're looking for, because the original hardware offload, as it was, you couldn't pass the queues field. It would just, just well, you could pass it, it got ignored and dropped. So it was never actually passed down to the device. It just got ignored and left it by the wayside. So there was some okay, so wiggle room in the interface. So I locked it down uh, a little bit tighter. And then what we're going to do is probably try to look at doing the hardware field value to specify like a version of the offload to do. OK. And, yeah. and those versions will be documented somewhere. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so it will be <clears throat> more friendly to humans after this. Right. OK. And so ideally, when we do this, then we can pass it with version 2. And the kernel will say, well, no, this device doesn't support version 2, so I'm not paying attention to the queues. I'm not paying attention to the rate limit. Don't try to ask me to do that. Okay. And whereas with this set, you'll be able to pass version 2, and it should recognize it. And this syntax existed before? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, that so, so if, if you did it without the hardware offload, right. it would actually give you queue counts based on that. And okay. it would lay out the queues for you. And so we thought that would be a really useful feature to have. So if you wanted to, you could say, you know, my default traffic class has you know, whatever the number of CPUs is in the system, and my lesser ones, maybe I only need like one queue for all of my control traffic that's on TC7 or whatever. Right. And so you just break things out that way and lay them out so you don't saturate the system with a ridiculous number of queues. The other, yeah, so the other thing is this one here. Yeah. What, what, you're trying to do what? You're uh, basically, we are saying instead of going, instead of redirecting the traffic to just each zero, within yeah. the each zero for a certain traffic class. So a traffic class sort of uh, would 802.1p tag value means traffic class? No, this TC one is the the one where the a priority right. to TC map. Okay, so it would be this this queue here. Yeah. Well, no, that's yeah? false. Okay, so that's not a queue. Uh, it's those a, numbers it's a prior are the priority. Map, right? Prior map, yeah. Yeah, it's a prior, prior map which converts okay. over to a TC. So okay. yeah. Oh yeah, I guess okay. So, so yeah. It's it would be this. TC it, map. it would be this guy here then. TC yeah. one. So basically, okay. the easiest way yeah. to think of it. Okay. It, so one says just move it over to that second grouping there, the two at two. Yeah. So move it over to that set of group, uh, at that group of queues versus the first. Okay, I'm kind of a little uncomfortable with that because you're tying it to the, we, we you wrote SKB edit, right? Yes. Could we not use SKB edit for this? It won't work for this. W why is that? Because you're just telling the hardware to put something in your metadata maybe or. Well, that's the thing. There's no SKB no. at this point. It's done in hardware. It's done. Right, this is done in it's the done hardware. hardware. So basically, right now we already have something that says take, you know, for like switch dev, for instance, take this traffic and put it on the VF. And now this is a, if the VF supports TCs, you can say take this traffic and put it on TC1 on that VF. And that's basically the idea behind yeah, it. it. Look, I, I don't care about humans that much, but it does look a little uh, unfriendly. Well, is it just the naming? Because that's the thing, is essentially. <laughs> Could we have an action that, that wraps this thing? Like, set in hardware TC. Well, because there's not any actual metadata that goes along with it. That's the thing. It, essentially, a TC ends up being a subgroup within a net dev itself. 
So like that MQ prio thing defines those four Q groups and we're wanting to somehow target one of those Q groups. On transmit, yes, we can get away with using priority because priority indirect maps back to TC. But on the receive side, there's not a good way to do it because the problem is priorities. Okay, I I'm just worried that Shrijit is gonna send me an email complaining how complex this is. <laughs> he's, he's done that before. Uh, yeah, okay. we can probably discuss a penalty <laughs> box. Penalty box. Okay. Uh, is it, uh, more slides or? Yes, one more slide. Okay. The quick one. Lucas, do you have a USB stick? So, <clears throat> we saw similar activity basically table creation and linking via a TC flower. So likewise, I think it will be nice to as well have uh, an ability to specify the IP address range, not just based on the mask and uh, basically any action such as allow, drop, count, and mark. So this is generally when we have the hardware ACL, how we can offload some of this feature in the hardware ACL uh, using the absolute ranges for the IP address and the port one. And uh, the next one is the hardware lag and the port broadcast domain group action. So I'll let Anjali answer that last two. Um, prod, uh, so sorry, I, I didn't quite follow this one. Any suggestion on one and two? Uh, I was thinking if you can explain the TC flower itself, which will take the port address range and uh, action Yeah, I think port address range is a useful feature. Yuri? What? Adding port ranges? Sorry. in Port ranges, a port range. Uh, I wanted to look at port 16 to 1500 within flower. Uh, How challenging would that be? You need multiple hash? It's doable, yeah. It's hard. Just saying this? A little bit harder, yeah. But I, I was you, thinking about it, it's doable. You, you may need multiple um, because it's going to be a power of two. So you'll probably need to split them into, into right. two or more. But it is doable, and it's a useful feature. So you are going to um, to just add it there, or how, I, I don't see how the range plays in this. Sorry. You said ranges, right? Yeah, the port address ranges and the IP address range. So right now we have not added, but that's something we're seeking to get an input. Does it even make sense? Okay. okay. Uh, the next one is a port slash broadcast domain group action. So uh, the first one, uh, we were talking about the table creation and linking. Is that, uh, Jerry, you're already working on that, I guess, right? Almost table. The, w uh, with the TC flower, uh, adding the ability to create uh, tables and link them? Yeah. But no, uh, he, he's going to talk about that. It's next. generic. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I have I a couple think, slides to okay. run out. Yeah. Okay, so I guess. Yeah. Okay, so the last two uh, that, uh, you know, we are um, looking again from the hardware perspective, the rules that we add in the hardware, if we can group them better uh, for optimal use, that's where it is coming from. So um, for now, any um, rule that we add, mirrored egress rule, uh, it kind of has an implicit source and destination kind of uh, uh, in it. So you, you have a match action and you have a destination where you want that packet to be forwarded, but also as part of your TC uh, rule, you specified uh, the interface from which that packet is coming. Uh, I mean, the hardware could choose to ignore that interface and apply it for the whole, uh, you know, the web or the whole, uh, you know, bridge. Um, or, you know, will that be a better idea if I could give a hint in, uh, there instead of using the source interface, I give the swi uh, source uh, switch. Oh, cool. um, I got it. Yeah, well, basically, the problem is that currently in TC, you, uh, the QDSC is per device. So yeah, when you add um, when you add the flower classifier instance or any um, filter instance in, uh, in that QDSC, it's per that net device. So you cannot do that. It's it's something which I am trying to handle as well uh, to, sh to actually be able to share the filters uh, among the Q-disks. Uh, yeah, I think Melanox, uh, you know, you, you guys will have the same problem where you really want optimal rules, so you want to group them yeah. together. Uh, it's, the problem is two ways. One is for grouping, uh, you know, to apply the same match criteria for packets from wherever they came, but right. ended up in, in, in one, one interface. 
The other one is, um, I was talking when we were talking about the protocol header, where if I can apply a rule for multiple uh, protocol types that are grouped together, as long as they have the same field. So that, that's another opti optimization that uh, would be good for hardware. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yes, uh, can I switch to this one? Oh, it's already there, okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Hello, I'm Mondolin. I'll, uh, I'll be speaking about uh, DPA devices and the TC offload we have and the ones we plan for this. Uh, uh, you, you. Right here. Okay. So uh, in case uh, anybody wants to read the code after, after this, uh, <laughs> l let me tell you where to find it. It's in drivers net Ethernet Freescale. And the reason for that is when we started this, we, we were Freescale. Um, Freescale was acquired by NXP. You can see that Freescale is actually a, the, the semiconductor spin-off of Motorola, Philips spin-off a company called NXP, and uh, we are currently in the process of being acquired by Qualcomm. So probably it's a good idea to keep the folder name as it is and not change it each time the companies decide to buy each other. Now, um, Jamal, did you say... Uh, Two slides in ten, ten minutes or ten slides in two minutes because I... Uh, as fast as you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as long as it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when, uh, when I'm talking about DPA, I'll probably uh, refer to DPA1. Uh, there are several, uh, several variants of, of this uh, architecture. DPA comes from uh, data path acceleration architecture. It was introduced in 2008. On PowerPC, uh, currently it's also found on ARM, and it has a newer generation which is trying to address some issues that I will try to uh, explain. So, uh, presently, what what we do have is uh, support for PowerPC in the vanilla kernel. Uh, we have some patches in review that we hope will be able to put in a good shape and uh, get merged to get support for the ARM platforms for DPA1, and we are preparing DPA2 support. And uh, we, we don't have much in, uh, in the way of uh, TC offloads uh, ready. We, we do have some RX and TX checksum to, to get beyond the dust ping. We, we were joking that the DP from DPA is from dust ping, and acceleration is going to come later. Uh, the the MQPO support we, we introduced is, uh, is, is basic, it's supporting four priority levels. Uh, these are mapped to some, uh, some hardware, uh, hardware prioritized word queues. Now, uh, this is not a fish, it's a diagram of uh, the architecture. We were, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we, we are the weird guys which don't have a ring, are not uh, on a PCA bus. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, software constructs and hardware constructs that differ from the usual uh, networking driver. Those, uh, those big uh, spots are uh, the queue manager, we have hardware queues. Uh, we also have uh, something called the buffer manager, uh, which is central to, to our uh, acceleration architecture, and also we have what we call a frame manager. Uh, for each of these animals, we, we were required to put together a driver and upstream it, and in the end, upstream the DPA Ethernet driver. That came as a surprise to some people, where they were asking, okay, this is your FMAN driver, where is the Ethernet? No, it's coming later. So. Uh, this, uh, uh, you, you said we have time, so I'll spend some, something like 10 minutes for each of the, those blocks. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a diagram for, for the driver we have since 2008. Uh, it's a Linux driver, it's open source, but uh, uh, talking about freedom, uh, you are free to read that code. It's only 100,000 lines of code, so I was a bit shy to send it for review. Uh, so what, what we did was to uh, start over, and uh, th this is what uh, what the one of those drivers I was talking about it looks like, or kinds of blocks. These are uh, so used how, for. How, how uh, does someone write an application for this thing? 
Yes, uh, so that code base I was telling you about, those 100,000 lines of code are part of the SDK, which is freely available and is... So you have an SDK? Yeah. That's, uh, that's offering support for uh, offloads, uh, all kinds of so stuff, IPsec okay. offloads, not... And, and I'm hoping you're here. That whatever. You but know, what we are know, doing now is yes, reinventing yes, that yes. in a smaller package. So um, the current FMON driver is uh, 10,000 lines of code, not 100. And um, what we are trying to do now is work on that accessibility part so to make the code readable and um, also come up. W what happened here is that uh, the guys working on this enabled everything. So that's great, but uh, maybe you don't really need everything. You need only the rev relevant parts, and we started with the relevant parts. And that's, that's how we are trying to build okay, so you, you relevant features and not everything, because it's we, impossible. We don't like SDKs around here. So. Yes, I know. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, you, so uh, you, currently you, you, we, are, we have two sets of drivers that we are maintaining. Okay. Those uh, we were talking about. The whole solution is something like 150k lines of code. The new one is 20k. Okay, but you're moving towards kind yeah. of. Kind and of we, we are now trying to reinvent this uh, and the line. What happens? Uh, you can imagine a decade ago. Uh, it's actually nine years coming and saying, uh, we would like to have uh, some uh, offloads of uh, TC in hardware. Uh, probably it wasn't a good time. Yeah. So, yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, th this uh, ugly picture is uh, what, what we have on a newer set of devices. Uh, th this is something called the uh, customer egress edge uh, uh, traffic management. Uh, actually, what this does is QoS on the egress side, and you have all kinds of uh, features in place, which if somebody looks carefully at this, it resembles HTB to a certain point. It's not uh, perpetually uh, hierarchical. It has a, ser a series of layers. Uh, what you see there, there are queues, frame queues. We aggregate those into work queues. There are priorities between them. Work queues, again, get prioritized into um, different uh, different uh, so elements, and the those the get sort of into the interface in the end. And uh, for each of those levels, you have priorities, and you also have uh, shaping, and uh, you can set uh, committed rate, access rate, and so on. So it's very like HDB in a, in a way. What we are trying now to do is to understand which would be the best way to introduce this so this looks like HTB, you said, right? So yep. you, you have the concept of a class. Is that would that be like an AcuDisk? You know, in a yeah. And then you have levels. You don't have a hierarchy. You can have one schedule. Well, a schedule. We, we have the parent in the right, and then we have the children here. So you, you can have parenting of yeah uh, equivalent to AcuDisk. You you have the root QDisk in the right, and then you have the children of the classes here. Okay. And and this is the, essentially a, an output port, is that correct? Yeah, and you have their... Uh, but you don't have hierarchies, is that correct? Uh, not, uh, we cannot add another layer, we cannot add it. So you it's can, just can. Uh, the parent oh, and that, that's this, fine. this I mean, set. HTB will work fine there. Yeah, uh, there, there are some, some questions and I summarized those uh, later. Um, you need to understand how the hardware looks and what you can or you cannot do because otherwise you, you won't no, be able to write rules. As, as a user, I don't care. I mean, I, yeah. I, if, I'm, if you're telling me you support HTTP, I just configure HTTP, correct? Yeah. Then underneath so you have to hide that from me. The, the problem is if you want to go deep, you yeah. cannot because the hardware can't. And that's right. another problem. So we need some capability exchange maybe, say what yeah. you could do. And so um, now that, 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 that's a summary of what, what, uh, what we want to do, what we we plan to do. Uh, there are multiple ways we can go. Uh, there's an uh, effervescence in this area. We, we are looking at Flower and it's mapping well to our hardware abilities and it's also more readable, probably more uh, user-friendly. Uh, we could do U32 offloading just as well, but uh, probably that would be a second priority. We have our main priority to do some Eric hashing to, to improve our forwarding performance, but uh, that's, that's likely to come soon. Uh, we, we cut a lot of debug stuff uh, from, uh, from the driver we sent upstream, and we probably need to, to think about some critical uh, debug uh, features that we need to add back. And I, I've seen some, uh, some slides that uh, point us to a good direction. In, uh, so what kind here. of debug stuff is this? 
uh, uh, when you have this uh, this huge uh, an animal, you, you need to see into the hardware and right. Uh, so it's with something like what you yeah. presented on DeepPipe, maybe. Yeah, that that's uh, that's uh, that's very interesting for us, and we'll probably try to. So my, my view that. is, you may not have to support U32 if flower can be extended to yeah. have extended uh, offset length values as one yeah. of the types, uh, because you know. Flower could include U32. Um, yeah. Most of the time, we write apps around this stuff, so I don't care about humans personally. I mean, we uh, writing a, you could write applications that would make it more human friendly if needed. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah. Um, also, we, besides uh, the filters, uh, we we are looking at uh, we, we first look at uh, TBF and probably. HTB, it's it's closer to what we we can do on the hardware. Uh, we have that limitation; we cannot do everything HTB does. And th th there are some questions from this. Yeah. And uh, uh, what uh, what we also need to to understand is how we can leverage what we have in the hardware, which is strict priority weighted fair queuing, red weighted red that can be configured, and. In, in regards to what we already discussed, we, we, we need probably to think, not, not only us, but probably the whole community should, should think about. Uh, this, this, this is a common problem for, for everybody, I guess. There are hardware features which are not perfectly mapping to the software features. And how do you expose those limitations? And how do you configure them? Because right now there's a wide array of options. And uh, I don't know, uh, I think DCB is used. Yes. DevLink is an option, I think. DevLink, I think, is. Uh, but the Probably more, the more general to. question is, yeah. Eric, for example, can you see? Can you pass the mic to Eric? Uh, so, Eric, do you see HTB as ever being able to be offloaded? Your favorite key disk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, probably part of it, at least. It, it can be done. I mean, uh, yeah, the full-blown uh, HTB can be problematic with a uh, lot of depth. But if we have priority. one hierarchy, for example, instead but of ha most of, I, I think most of the use of HTB are pretty limited. Yeah, I'm not sure everybody mm. uses a full-blown. Uh, do you use hierarchies at all? Uh, hierarchy. You don't use hierarchies, do you? Like no, we have, we have a single chip. level, basically. OK, so it That's could work use. with your hardware. Yeah. What about you, uh, you guys? Did you ever consider going the other way and saying, let's make a new QDIS that behaves like my hardware? Uh, and that's, that's and, then, and if like you did that, then people could test it and your offload would match what the QDIS offers. And especially if you have a restricted set, maybe you can only eat two levels, or maybe you're, you have a weighted red that's better and more, um, let's be honest, I've done the mark and red stuff and it's, we, we, we are, uh, broke. We are, uh, we are uh, asking ourselves these questions. Uh, you can see it on the slide, uh, the next, uh, next set of things to, to think, to consider. So we can either try to extend whatever exists, as uh, our colleagues uh, already started doing for MQ Prio, and adding so more MQ features. So MQ Prio has been doing this for years, but uh, if I had Eric correctly in his presentation at NetConf, you see it may be a problem now, right? with the multipath entries. Yeah, so actually, yeah, so the, the ability to offload the, the MQ prior stuff with the rate limiter per class looks awesome, yeah. That, that you like that? Yeah, because when you have multiple queues, a lot of transmitute, then you have this effect of uh, so it's instead of line blocking, so that would be nice to have this. Instead of having HTB, you would rather have MQ prior with, with rate limiting support. Right. Mm. Okay. okay. So the, the deciding on a direction, it's, it's uh, in our mutual benefit. So it's, it's good that we're having this discussion. Um, I, as you said, we, we were thinking also about trying to invent a new QDisk that well maps to our hardware. The problem is if everybody does that, will probably be too many. So maybe trying to to fit the existing ones, such as extending MQ periods, so it's a better idea. And another, another topic that probably needs to be considered is what we can do in the in the way of mixing software and hardware offloads. 
I, is that is that feasible? Is it yeah. possible? And we're we actually doing that with uh, yeah. filters, right? You can when you spec you can specify which filter goes in hardware and which one doesn't. Right. I think Rory's uh, example showed it. There's like a soft uh, was a skip skip software option. Yeah. yeah. It says okay, this isn't going to work in software. That's Just right. skip it and go ahead and put it into the hardware. Uh, the, 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 my question is, for example, HDB. You have that infinite. Uh, I don't think we have that at the QDisk level yeah. itself. Yeah. It's can you do that? that? So if you don't have hierarchies, I mean, half of the hierarchy, th there's no reason to. Well, well see, that's the thing. Is that's one of the other reasons for using MQ Prio is it actually has the concept of if you, if you can specify that okay, I wanted this to go into hardware in this way, and then if it doesn't fit into hardware, it says okay, no, I can't do that. I'm just gonna return an error. You get feedback that it can't do that, or? right? Okay. So, so it calls into the NDO setup TC, right? And if there's a problem there, it just returns the error from NDO setup okay. TC instead of trying to set it up in software. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't see a good reason to have hierarchies that some of them sit in software and some in hardware because typically, if you're doing, let's say, rate limiting or queuing in hardware, you don't want it to hit CPU, right? Yeah. So the, there's no good reason to say I'm gonna have half of it in in software. In a, in a hierarchy. Anyway, we, we're kind of running out of time. Yeah. Can we have the schedule back? I'm wondering who's next. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Where we go next, uh, what is it? Okay, so we're gonna talk about performance. I don't see Ben, is Ben here? Oh, there you go, you wanna come up here? Uh, I don't know if you should go fast or? You've got like two slides, right? Okay, here you go. Where are your slides? That, that's yours, I think. Is it? No, that's me. That is me, okay. Yours, this one. Go F5. So at, at Nentronome right now, we are in the process of implementing offloads for uh, TC Flower now. And so we've got a little bit of preliminary re results based on uh, using an existing firmware that already implements uh, offload for OVS flows. So we're using the same firmware, but we're now using it for offloading TC Flower. So one of the tests that we did recently is uh, just a basic uh, f flow setup test where uh, packets are being in injected and uh, the OVS user space is, is going and installing uh, flow rules. So with, with this is unfortunately the, I, di I didn't have all the data and was able to put them on both on the same slide, but this is the OVS case. So it, it, it's nice and flat and linear. There's a bit of weirdness in the middle for some reason, but uh, it basically is able to go and maintain the same flow setup rate until you hit sort of the, the, the end of the supported offloads or number of flows. So is that the cut? Does it fall off there? What is that? Um, I, that? That's just the traffic being turned off, I think. Okay. So with TC, and, and this was a bit of a surprise, is that it, we have some problems as more f flows are added to the flower uh, classifier. So it starts off at a, at a reasonable rate, um, and then it sort of gets slower and slower as, as more and more rules are present. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following this, so the, X, the Y axis is Y-axis is previously the, installed the, num rules. the number of flows, so the number of rules that are installed, and the the x-axis is the the time in seconds. So if you had five thousand and you installed another thousand, that would two thousand five hundred. That takes you. That's the yeah. curve to seven thousand five hundred. Yeah. So I, I I ran the test in software myself uh, th this morning, and so when you start off with TC Flower and you you add in a, a single rule, it takes less than a mil millisecond to go and install the rule into the Flower classifier. Once you have uh, two hundred thousand rules already in there, it's now taking forty milliseconds to oh, install a single rule. So these are a bit not being they offloaded into hardware, correct? Or yes. Are they in software? So, so for, for, for data, if we were actually passing data, the, the hardware will be matching these rules and then performing the action based on the rules. So it's, it's, not, it's not a question of 
what the the half the packets per second. No, I understand. More. You you yeah. just it's an off-bound interface. You, yeah. right? But um, but when you add the rule, do you specify skip software or it's just going straight? Um, to, or you so just add it in. So, so right now this is just a simple drop action. Uh, um, and it goes, it gets offloaded to hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Not and it, it's not both to hardware and software. It's just you say skip software, right? Or you don't remember that. Um. I, Oh, in in this case, it's actually being installed in software as well. So you, in you software as well. That. Okay. So so in in the OVS case, was it also being installed in software? Yes, in the OVS users. Basically. Both both in software and in hardware, yeah. like in the kernel in software and in hardware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, and, and like I said, it's the same behavior without the hardware offload, just doing the software install. So yeah, my gut feeling is maybe Yuri. Maybe there's a hash table limitation because we're finding this a lot of these issues in TC. <laughs> well, it's yeah. probably a hash table bucket size thing. Yeah, we need to change it to use the extensible hash table. I thought so it, I thought it does use our hash table. It's our hash, it's our hash table. Yeah. So maybe you hit you hit some wall there. Yeah. Did you do any parf and check out what what it's doing? I I only got the I, I haven't had a chance to look into it in detail. Okay. I'm, I'm you promised to, to look into it so. and. Weeks, okay. Because, so. uh, uh, sorry, someone. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious. Normally, OBS will start to purge the flows from the table after they're idle for a few seconds. Is that happening as part of your test, or did you turn that off somehow? That I don't know, because I wasn't the one running the OBS test. So, unfortunately. Okay, anyone else with questions? Okay. So, but send send an email with. What Parf says, maybe we yep. could. Okay, this is actually a good segue into mine. Yeah. Because. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess can we see the scheduled slide? Let me put that back there. I, I think I'm next. Um, Yeah, okay. So actually, Ben's thing sort of kind of leads into, okay, yeah. Uh, yes, it was me afterwards. So what? Ne what's next? All right, it's still Yuri than me. Okay, so we did some tests uh, on, this is purely actions. You can add actions without having bound them to any filters, right? So you, you can add uh, as you, so one thing we did observe was what Ben uh, just described. You basically, as you keep adding more, it gets slower and slower and slower and slower. Uh, Chunyan is there, she did, she did a lot of these tests. And uh, likewise, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a classifier called uh, CLSFW, which also has hash buckets. Um, what we, upon investigating, this is what we found. So essentially, okay, I'm, I'm just going a, doing a computer science 101 here, but it may excite somebody. So basically when you add a rule, every action has a 32-bit index. If you don't specify, specify one, the kernel will give you one. So you add that object, and it has a 32-bit index. A hash algorithm is run here to select a bucket. Then you come down and by default, the kernel has 16 buckets. So there's no problem if you add, let's say, 32 actions. Once you start, in our case, we start hitting millions, or 1.6 million, for example, and you have 16 buckets, uh, any of these things here could have up to 100,000 uh, linked list entries. So how does uh, adding an action work? You go up, uh, you say, okay, I've got an index 16, you, create, you run your hash, you select a bucket, you start walking that bucket all the way to the end, see, shit, it doesn't exist, I'm gonna create it now. So you malloc, you add it. The next action, now your number 20,000 does the same. It comes in there, you calculate a hash bucket, goes all the way, it doesn't exist, you, you create, you add. So very simple trick, what we did was just basically, let's go and change the hash table in the kernel, 
as you, as you double it, the performance doubles. Now, of course, that's a hack, so uh, we'll be submitting patches to our hash table. So that's, that's issue one that we found. So that's why your characteristics look very similar to this. As you keep adding rules, it gets worse. Now, replace works the same way, right? But replace is cheaper because you don't have to malloc. So once we fixed that performance, we started seeing uh, the per CPU allocation of stats that sh started showing up in the path profile as the highest, the most expensive thing. I talked to Eric a little bit. He recognized it. He says, uh, we, we may have to do batching to solve this. OK, so, so that's issue one. Uh, what's left is for us to submit high. I don't think anybody will accept. I don't think Dave will accept patches where we just enlarge the hash bucket size. Okay, So we'll do this right. It will dynamically adjust itself as needed. OK, so that's one. The next one is. Okay, so here, now we do a, read a lot of stats. So if you can imagine you have 100,000 actions and you're dumping them every thousand, a, a million actions, maybe 16 million actions, and you're dumping these actions constantly. Uh, that was, well, in our case, the constant means every five seconds we're sucking in the 16 million actions to just collect stats and we, we store them somewhere for analysis. So uh, what we found was Issue number one was when the, when the kernel was doing a dump, uh, it will send up to maximum of 32. So the user says, give me a dump. You have 16 million of them, and it gives you maximum of 32. So you, you can imagine how many times we have to cross user space with 32 entries at a time. Uh, a very quick hack was to increment the uh, size of the Netlink message. So it, so, uh, literally, I think at some point, Roman took like what, 50, an hour to dump uh, just a million, 1.6 million rule actions. 40 minutes to just dump the actions. Um, if we had time, I would have run the demo, and it'll, it, it's a really cool demo on how we, we improved this. You should see the old TC. If you run old TC versus what we changed. So, the solution was just let's increase the uh, Netlink message size, the, the one that gets allocated for sending back messages. And uh, we were able to do it in, say, 15, 20 seconds, something that took over 40 minutes before. That patch is still, so I presented this at Netconf, actually, and we went back and forth on discussions. Um, and uh, we're going to, it looked appealing enough that it could be made generic for other, t uh, for other subsystems that use Netlink dumping. Um, uh, so, so that's one. That's, that's a trivial one. I, it's limited by the fact that, say, when somebody dumps, you can just keep enlarging this Netlink message if the receiver socket buffer is small. So we have to check against the receiver socket buffer. My patches didn't have that. I'm going to be working on that piece. So I'm going to submit an RFC patch that just says, here is what we think. I'm sure somebody... Brave will say, let's make, this is how you make it generic. And if not, it serves our purpose. So uh, it's standalone enough that it could be used for actions where our big problem is. I don't know what, what do you think, Dave? Uh, if, if we were to just, uh, uh, no, this is the dumping now, right? So uh, that's the second one. I haven't talked about that one. This is, so. So the dumping of Netlink messages. Yes. I think uh, if we were just to um, adopt it for what we need, we're just going to make the NL message much X times NL message good size and less than uh, the receiver socket buffer. So the thing is, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're going to try to allocate a larger Netlink message, you're going to run into two issues. It, it may fail because of memory pressure, and we don't have such large order pages. So you need a fallback path to go back to the NL message good size case. Is the NL message good size always guaranteed? Or? I think it's a page or less or something like that. Therefore, it should work all the I time. See. If I not, see. Uh, that's something to address. The other thing is, by merely starting to use higher order pages, more often you'll be putting pressure on the memory subsystem. So it, and we may be starting to eat a lot of cycles in the page allocator as it tries to reclaim pages to satisfy your request. So there are, there are second order uh, effects that even if it's not failing, you will have on the system. So it's something to take into consideration. I think 
I think you should have an upper bound to not use more than, say, order three pages or something like that so it doesn't get out of control. Uh, I think you can mitigate the effects if you do something like that, but that's just my opinion. Uh, okay. We, we, we'll play around with this stuff for a bit longer. So, so since we're talking about high order pages um, and we copy this thing to user space at receive message, can we at some point use vmalloc there? So we had code to do that at one point, and I think we ran into all kinds of problems. Uh, but I think that had to do with when we had MMAP Netlink support. So we undid the vmalloc uses and went to high order pages, and then we removed v the MMAP support now, so we may be able to revisit that again. I think the, the problem is that if we were to generate a Netlink message in interrupt context, you can't change the kernel map from, from there. You can't change the kernel page tables. Kernel page tables can't be changed from interrupt context. And that's the reason that vmalloc can be used. This is also the reason why we can't, generally speaking, use vmalloc to handle our hash table resize allocation failures as well. So I, I, there are a lot of really tricky details to deal with if we go to vmalloc and that would be, I don't have a, a clear answer on that. But it's an interesting idea. But if M the MMAP support was the only blocker, then we could do it again. So. Okay, we got some work to do. Yes. So uh, the other thing is, so if you're dumping 16 million actions, and they're kind of useless, you, they have, nothing has changed in the stats. That, that's another optimization that I've been, uh, I had played with. So essentially what you do is, so as an example, here's a bunch of actions that are bound to some filters and only the yellow ones have changed, right, since the last time you, you did a read from the kernel. We don't want the green ones to be showing up. It, I mean, we could. We, so it, it should be optional that I want everything or I want only things that have changed since I last asked you, right? So this is what I did for, the, uh, for NetConf. Uh, however, this as we'll see, it's probably insufficient at this point. We'll have to, we'll have to go back to the drawing board. So user just basically says, uh, please give me all the actions that have been, uh, give me a dump of all actions of type uh, Polisa, and only give me the ones since have been updated since the last time. And the last time means five seconds ago. Uh, we, we had a good discussion on what it, how do you convey this information to the kernel to say since the last five seconds. It could be that we convert, because the kernel deals with GIFs. that's how we take uh, the, the timestamp that's stored in the, in the action is GIFs based. So do you take the GIF and convert, the seconds and convert it to GIF? Do you wait until, uh, is it a differential? You send the five seconds and then it gets converted to kernel time. And then you go and walk these things and say, yeah, it hasn't been updated since uh, uh, the last time. Or there's also the danger that uh, you may be, it may take longer than five seconds to dump everything. <laughs> if you have 16 million actions and you're dumping all of them and you're saying give me something from the last time and you're not done in five seconds, you will miss some of these uh, stats. Anyway, this is how I did it. Works, gives a good demo, but I think we need to go back and uh, consider those inputs we, we've uh, received. Okay, so that, that's it. Any questions? All right, uh, next is, here it's you, I think. Oh, sorry, can I see the agenda? Right, okay, yeah. Ah, Mike. Okay, uh, about the dumping. Yes. And uh, the optimization that you did will uh, give me everything that changed since last time. Yeah. Uh, will it be uh, better to use uh, like a generation ID instead of timestamp? So that uh, whenever you dump, the generation ID increases and then you get, it's easier to, to filter that way and so you don't depend on GFEs or yeah, anything. Yeah, the challenge is this, right? I mean, okay, so if something gets updated, yes. Uh, the challenge is in a multi-user environment, who increments that dump? Who increments that ref? Uh, if you have several uh, applications doing dump. And the table is not specific to a user. So 
The on, so the only way you could do it is there's a structure that gets created every time you issue a dump. It's called the Netlink callback structure that's associated to the process that's requesting for this dump. So, so every process can keep its own generation ID, last generation ID that it saw. Yes. So, so, so that could be in terms of GIFIs, right? You could store the GIFIs. And because every action actually has a GIFI, has four count stats. Okay. One is, when, was it, when, is, when did it last see traffic? So it's called the last uh, use time. When was it last updated, if someone changed the policy in it? Uh, when was it first used? And this, this other field that you're describing can only be applied not to the action itself, but to the user. So, so that's the kind of general, that's my next implementation is going to be based on storing this timestamp instead on, on the callback structure. Uh, actually, Not just like per user. Uh, Sorry. well, just a thought. Uh, if nothing else, you could like uh, so make it a global generation ID that you would keep and return that along with the stats. So then it would just be okay. Give me the last update since generation ID, you know, five. When and then, you know, you do it the next time, and it, that one returns like maybe six or seven. You know, you know, and you'd just be going through, and it'd basically be a way of tracking it via Epic or something. So I'm I'm going to post like RFC patches and let people fight it out. Okay, so next is going to be Yuri. Again, so Yuri has some very interesting ideas on, there you go. So these are new feature requests, etc. Yeah, so I, we mentioned it already during the, uh, my earlier slides. Uh, there is need uh, to do multi-tables in TC, and uh, the current state is... Can I, can I, can I just interrupt? Does, does anybody understand the multi-table, what it means? Does, you, you understand what it means. People understand that TC has basically, there's some very few classifiers that allow you to have the I'm concept... Going to, I'm eh? going to describe it, actually. Oh, you're going to describe it. Okay, <laughs> please. Go ahead. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. The thing is that you have this Q-disk that maintains one chain of uh, filters, and uh, here, here is the, uh, like, you, you have this um, filter li list uh, array in each uh, QDisk private structure, and there is, uh, there is this helper uh, op, which allows uh, the, the CLS API to get the 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 pointer to the to the array uh, of the of this chain, and um, to process the chain, uh, each QDisk has to call uh, TC classify function, and TC classify function basically just walks the chain, and uh, for each chain member it calls uh, the classify uh, callback. Uh, it's possible to do reclassification. And basically, one chain equals one table. So if I'm talking about multi-table, I mean multi-chain. And uh, now you can have only one chain per QDisk. So the motivation is uh, for, for the multi-table or multi-chain is to be able to assign uh, a, a, um, a tree, essentially a tree of a tables instead of single table. And uh, it, uh, it means a big deal for the, uh, for the offloading uh, because it allows us to utilize hardware a lot better than if we just do one table there. Uh, Yeah, there is, there is possible to either do multiple chains in one QDisk or it is possible to also to uh, have a hierarchy of QDisks with uh, each, each, each of the QDisks of what, one chain. Uh, I think it's nicer to have multiple chains within one QDisk, but it's also 
possible to do it the other way. I'm now currently working on the first variant, but let's see how it will go. Uh, as a side effect uh, of these changes, uh, it would allow a multiple Q disk to actually ch ch share the block of chains. So it would be possible to, uh, if we if we offload uh, the rules which are generic to the whole uh, ASIC, uh, we can do we can share the resources uh, for multiple ports. We, we don't have to do per port uh, rules. Um, so the plan is to introduce some sort of a block which holds. Uh, many chains, and these chains uh, could be the in a uh, just linked list, and uh, each would have one uh, U32 index. That's uh, my idea. And uh, as a default, the chain number zero will be processed, and uh, basically everything will stay the same as it is now, so th there is no uh, performance penalty, no edit overhead. And this block will be uh, possible to, to be shared uh, among multiple Q disks. And you can actually see uh, the work in progress on this uh, uh, GitHub repository. Yeah, and this. So there are, are there any questions to the multi-table, multi-chain? Anybody? It's good. Okay. It will help um, uh, solve Mike. a lot of our problems. So, so Yuri, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed something. So you're going to have how many total tables? How many, and, how yeah. many chains? You yeah. can. Uh, it's not limited. And they, they have an index that I can reference. Yeah. Okay. And basically, that would be an action which will allow you to uh, allow you to jump into some specific chain, and uh, that action will will come will have pointer to the chain. Uh, will do, will not have the index, but the pointer directly. It should be pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm next. We're kind of. Uh, we have I have a couple of other slides for that, you. That's in the in the enhancement. That, that is in phase. enhancements. Oh, you want to talk about it? Oh, now? No, no, no. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, no. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go, go, go. Come. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I, there you go. Could be quick. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Could be controversial. So, uh, error reporting is problem for TC in general. So, we have an error talking to the kernel. It's like the error you will see when something is going yeah. wrong, but you yeah. don't know nothing. So that's not good, and would be probably better to uh, perhaps pass some arbitrary string f to the user who, will, who can actually find so. out what went wrong. I mean, string would be nice, or some other error code maybe. So it's, uh, where's Pablo? Does Pablo attend TC meetings? He's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Pablo, so pa Pablo, we, we, we have a volunteer over there. He, he's complaining about the same problem. I'm actually architecting this so. right now while you guys are talking about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. We have it, it's coming. It's coming. Okay. Good. Pablo, welcome to, welcome to the TC workshop, Pablo. Um, thank you, Jamal. Yeah. We're talking about the Netlink. Okay, so. All right, maybe we can skip it. Okay, I was so enthusiastic that you invited me to participate, but okay. Uh, yes, I want you to participate in, in the TC workshop. Okay, thank Say you. Say something. Uh, it's good, I like it. <laughs> 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 no, this, the, the, the Netlink. The Netlink uh, oh, the error reporting. Yeah, yeah, that's yes, what we're talking about. David said, we are, architect we are finishing the, the, the design now, so it's almost done. This is so cool. It's okay. Is it, is it done? Did you even, uh, here, here. Oh, I got yeah. it. Okay. So we just designed this about 20 minutes ago. 
Okay. Okay. So it's uh, if the application asks for this extended error reporting facility in NetLink, the NetLink Act, along with all the usual other aspects, uh, it, it gets four new attributes potentially. There is an error string, which is just a NetLink string that this, this says what the error type is. That's what you're mentioning here. Uh, there is an offset, so you can say where within the NetLink message the problem is occurring, like what specific value, but we recognize that there may be no specific context involved, therefore an unspecified value would mean... Is it the first attribute which, which some problem is going on? It depends upon the situation. So uh, for, for example, uh, so let me go through the rest of the attributes. I can come back and talk about the right. offset next. So the next thing you get is uh, an attribute. So this could be one of two things. It could be the number of the attribute, the attribute code for the one that's invalidly specified, like the value inside is wrong. The other thing it could be used for is to say there's an attribute that's missing. So foo needed to be in this construct and you didn't specify it, and that's where the offset can come in. You can say zero, which means a top level attribute was missing, or you could say the nested container is the offset you specify, and inside there I expected you to specify X. Okay. And there's a fourth attribute, which was, oh, uh, 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 subsystem specific error codes as well. So those are the four things we're that thinking cool. about adding to the NetLink Act error reporting, all based upon Pablo's uh, idea to, to kind of go in this direction, and uh, Johannes started working on it, so I think we'll have okay, some things uh, Johannes, you're just hiding there working on this all this time? Okay, there yeah. he is. So, and and uh, I, I just want to say, for the record, yeah. David Ahern said that we never do stuff, right. and I'm going to make sure we do stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said that we don't do stuff that we talk about for years, so I'm going to make sure today we do stuff. Oh, he was just trolling you. So oh, you're trolling perf. Well, that's yeah, okay. Right. Never mind. I take yeah. back what I okay, said. So, so the... I hope we can use it for success, right? If I just want to return success arc and I want to say, oh. I'll return a SHA-1 key with my success. Yeah, so that's something I haven't done yet, but please, work on, it. please work on it, get on it now. Okay, next. Yeah, uh, another thing is naming consistency is kind of yeah. weird in TC. So we have filter and classifier, which is right. the same thing. Uh, also, the names of the uh, like you have T filter notify, TCF proto. You mean the CLS, naming convention in the code? It's all the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I had nothing to do with that. Okay, all right. I know at uh, one point you're, you're you. pointing a finger. It's some Russian guy that did that. Yeah. <laughs> also, ext and action yeah. is the same thing as well. Uh, one or two letter variables on a lot of places which is telling you essentially nothing, and the same combinations are used for totally uh, different things. So it's hard, hard so you, to decipher. you don't like TP? Sorry? You don't like TP <laughs> as a variable name? TP that's, so, that's hi highly used at, everywhere. At okay. least it's used everywhere and for nothing else. That's good, but yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there might be good to have some namespaces, like uh, namespace prefixes for the functions. So, so, you, so you actually know where the function is located, at least something like that. Do we, how far do we go? Like, uh, how long is this function name? Uh, at least to give you some hint that this is... It's easy to grab, basically. Yeah, it's just a small thing, but it will help. Yeah. Um, another thing is the, uh, the user space API. And the, for example, in, uh, for, the, for the classifiers, there's a lot of duplication of the NetLink attributes. You can see for BPF, Flower, U32, other classifiers, these this, uh, attributes do the same thing or are used for the same thing. Uh, also, if you look at the, uh, the prefixes, that's also, you can use TC and TCA, NetM. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know I, why. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's redundant because they all mean the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the question is if we can do something about it. And I was thinking about uh, perhaps introducing some cleaner approach as a new generic NetLink API, which would... I think uh, the, the, the problem is um, you, you'll have to do the TCA message level as opposed to NetLink level. Yes, so when someone says, here is an action, 
when it's the same action as uh, any, every other classifier. It just has a different name because it's a different classifier. Right. That, that is uh, but abuse, I would say, right? Yeah, but yeah, it should be the same attribute. Right? Yes, so, I, yeah, I agree that, with you. That's why I'm, uh, but you can do nothing about it. That's the problem. Right? You, you can't uh, get away without breaking backward compatibility. Right. It's right. also, you, there, there's, there's actually no point where to put this generic attrib attribute to. Uh, no, you can, you can put it at, say, the TC, the TC sub-service level message. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we can talk it, about it. It's not nice. Yeah, I'm, what I'm just uh, thinking about just to do new API and to throw away what, the what old What would the new API look? Oh, no, you can't just throw the, the old API. What, 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 what would the In new ten API years. Huh? In 10 years. You have a lot of time to migrate. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> because, yes, uh, that's you know, it, this, will, this will get bigger and bigger and the API gets mo more polluted and and I believe that in 20 years or in 30 years, you can, we cannot stick with this API. No, I, so, so yes. eventually it has to change, so why not now, right? If you're brave, as long as you don't break all the old stuff. I will do eventually, <laughs> in, in 10 years. <laughs> oh, in 10 years it's okay to break it, so I have yes. no problem. No, okay. <laughs> since this is a new API, um, I don't know if this is legit or if it's blasphemy, um, but you could do something like a compat layer at user mode. So, uh, like a library that converts the old deprecated API to the new uh, modern API. I think we may have to make that um, a requirement before we move forward. <laughs> I'd say, okay, first we add compat API, and then yeah. that's the first task. Then it will be fair that New users can use new APIs. Yeah, that, that's the plan eventually uh, to have it can, like can the we, compact API inside the kernel. Can we have back that the slide? So yeah. So we, we are running out of time, unfortunately. So you have more or? That's all right. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Uh, okay. So I I think I'm gonna have I'm I'm sorry I'm gonna have to cut off some people that were at the end. Poor poor guys. I I get to present still. Because I was in the agenda, so. Uh, okay, I'll do this very quickly. So this is a new feature. I, oh, it's not really a new feature. I've had it at least for months. So one of the problems we have is, um, I don't know where I put that. Is, uh, oh, there's, there it is. If I wanted to add a graph of actions that look like this, to say match something, and then if it, you run some action foo, and based on the result, you want to go this way or that way, you, the only way you can do it today is you have to define two policies. You, you specify the same uh, filter with a priority that's a lower number that gets hit first, Say, okay, match foo bars, go to foo, based on that state, instead of saying pipe to here, you say continue, and then this other guy is going to be matched, and then you execute this, this graph, please. Right? Of course, if you have millions of rules, this becomes very annoying, because now you have to install two rules for every match you want, for, for, for each graph. So it happens that there is a... Uh, an opcode that already existed in, uh, in TC but was never fully implemented. It's called jump, so it's like a go-to uh, that allows me to do this. So I have some patches we discussed at NetConf. I think I'm going to have to add some sort of TTL field so the go-to doesn't go infinitely. That's, that's it. Uh, can we have the schedule? I think we have, say, 15 minutes. I'm not sure what we can do in 15. Who was next? Uh, okay, do you, I don't know if I have anything from you. So I've got Roman and Lior. Uh, so the Mellanox card, we've been working with the Mellanox card a little bit. Uh, Roman and company wrote, I've never seen, I haven't seen this code, but they wrote a GTP uh, encoder decoder. And the uh, Mellanox firmware was extended to be able to recognize GTP and dig deep into the packet and look at the inner headers. 
Uh, people interested to hear about it? Raise your hand. One, two, three, okay. Should you skip it? One, no, okay. Well, all right, your own, I guess. Because, because the other alternative is I was going to have Lucas show his very exciting test environment that we're now gonna push forward. We, I think we've got it this time. How do we test TC? So if someone makes changes to the kernel, you guys have to choose one or the other, right? If we push it into the kernel, um, um, and, and someone makes a small change in TC, we'll make them run a regression test that's built in to make sure nothing else breaks. So anybody up for that presentation? One, two, three, four. I'm sorry. So Lucas, uh, uh, so actually they had a demo right here. Could have shown packets coming in, but we, you can talk to these two guys afterwards. Uh, him and Leo is a guy sitting right standing next to where Lucas is standing. Okay, so Lucas, you're on. Do you want to come and show some magic here, maybe? I don't know. Demos never work, but let's see. Okay, yeah. Mike. Uh, you want oh. to use this one? Yeah, you can use this. Okay. All right, so uh, I was not aware that people were really that interested in the, in the testing subsystem, so thankfully I do have something ready. Um, so anyone who was at NetDev Tokyo uh, saw what I put together the first time around. Um, it was a lot of hand-coded um, Python for each individual test case. I was not happy with it at all. I thought it was ugly, it was messy, it was bordering on unmain unmaintainable, which considering that I basically volunteered to look after it meant that I was probably going to be, you know, in a living hell. Um, so what I did was I took some time and I rewrote and refactored and now the test cases are separate from the code. <laughs> um, this was the biggest achievement I had. I'm actually very happy with it. Um, it's a lot easier. So now we have, well, basically a bunch of metadata. We have an ID, we have uh, the name of the test itself, uh, category, it can actually fall under multiple categories, which comes in later when you actually go to run the tests. You can um, basically just run a subset if you only want to test actions. You can do that if you only want to test U32 filters, you can do that, as long as the tests themselves are categorized uh, properly. Um, sorry, this is actually a deprecated thing. Um, so then you have uh, your setup commands. This can be one or many, however many it takes to get the environment that you want in order to make the command under test to succeed, uh, which brings us to our next line here. Okay, so this is what um, this Python is actually going to evaluate the results of. So is it going to, re uh, what's its exit code? Okay, in this case we want it to return zero. And then um, I'm still big on, you know, querying to see did um, did the uh, kernel get the correct information? Is it going to return the correct information? So, you know, we're going to list the actions, and then we're actually going to look for, uh, in this case, index eight because I had already defined it in the command under test. Um, you can also do you know, match count, you know, I, I create five actions, does the kernel report five actions? Um, and then follow it, you follow it up with the teardown, and then this just repeats over okay, and over. Okay, so, so there's again. three phases, there's a set of phase. Yeah. Do, do people find this readable? Like, could someone create a TC test with this? And you, you have a pre, pre setup? And w w why, yeah. uh, why would I need an ID? It's just to, so I can. Um, I, ID just to keep track of. Okay, so this could be run from Jenkins, tests. for example, and, yeah. and I could draw yeah. some n n nice graphs or not? Yeah, you probably could. <laughs> Doesn't sound very helpful. What do I people have, think well, it's just I haven't done it yet, so. Eh? I haven't done a, like any kind of graphing with it yet, okay. so. No, but, but you, could, you could plot, you could say, go back five months and find when it broke or something. When yeah, it last like worked. Like if, you, if you're, um, 
if this is being run on a regular basis and the results are being stored like by some sort of operating yeah, okay. system, which would be fantastic to set so up. You, too, you so you have a preset phase, you have execution phase, and then you have a teardown, and then you run yeah. the next test case. Yeah. Um, a couple of the changes that I made in this as well, um, because if, again, anyone who was at the last uh, NetDev, um, all of these are actually being executed in a separate namespace so you don't pollute the host. Um, and what I had to do before was basically for each individual test or block of tests, uh, I had to go create that, create whatever devices were needed, and then tear down for each individual one. Uh, so I've actually even managed to improve the overall execution time um, over what I had in Japan, so. Okay. Um, what do people think about this? Any comments? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Maybe you, you want to run a demo or you think it's too risky? Uh, oh, you, no. Do you? Oh, no, no. Okay. Like, you can actually see um, the end results up here. So. Okay. There's where the IDs come in as well. It helps you narrow down an individual test case. And then oh, the Something name. happened there. Yeah. Um, so this is actually new to me. I don't know what this is. It did not like. Okay, maybe, maybe the. <laughs> the new netlink will help. We'll print exactly what happened there. <laughs> See, this is this is yep. what uh, Yiru was complaining about, right? Invalid argument. What the heck does that even mean? Oh, that's, right. that's something yeah. else. Ah. So, <laughs> invalid argument is good. Error talking to kernel. That's the oh, yeah. that's the one. <laughs> that's the that's the favorite. No, that's that's RTC saying that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so just to speed things along here, um, this specific problem happened because uh, I believe this is, was a setup error. Um, the test will execute if you encounter an error up and set down or tear down because then you know your your environment is not good anymore. Um, so if I can actually just oh no wait I know what I can do. Yeah fun. Oh yeah. Better? And move this, move it a little bit. It seems like it's being chopped off or something. Uh, no, it's it's fine. Like if yeah. you, there's a little gap over here. There we go. Yeah. Okay. There you go. There you go. Okay. People can see that, right? There we go. So I basically have a single a single test in the um, in the filter category right now. So you can actually see what a successful run looks like. So it's uh, spitting out the output in tap. If any of the tests fail, it will give you the output um, from the error. Can you explain what tap is, is for the uninitiated? Uh, tap, test anything protocol. So uh, okay. it gives you the start and end of the tests uh, by number. So you know if it's going to run 15 tests and you only get uh, you know 14 lines, you know it will basically so, help you figure out. And there are a lot of tools around, Rusty Russell yeah. was big on this. Uh, so it, there's a lot of tooling around tap. Yeah. Because if you output this format, you can run a gazillion. Yeah, this is pretty much the only format of that, that it's doing right now as okay. well, but it's very readable. So it basically gives you an okay or not okay, and if it uh, gives you the not okay, it tells you why. So okay. whether um, the verify command did not work or if the um, uh, expected exit code was bad. Okay. So. If I jump to zero, three, one, oh, sorry. I can actually demonstrate this by changing that. Oh. There we go. So, I still have a little bit of correction to do. Okay. Um, what happened there? Sorry? What, what happened? Uh, I told it to run the filters, and it did not run the filters, so. Okay. So you, it says not okay, what? Yeah. So I changed the exit code. Um, okay. So it tells you not okay, and apparently I have so to it's fix dependent this as well. So it's dependent on two things, right? An yeah. exit code that TC will return. Yeah. Well, and we're assuming that's all those returns, the correct exit codes. Yes. And number two, where you end up parsing on, the, on this command line, and yep. the result. Yeah. So if anybody, from now on, nobody's allowed to change TC output, because we're going to be parsing it, right? Actually, I think most tooling, most bash scripts out there were dependent on the output. Mike? 
Yeah, there's the Stephen Heminger's here. What am I talking about? Yeah. The output format at the start of the line, yeah. but if somebody wants to add something at the end of the line, I consider that okay. So if you're writing a parsing script, look through your stuff and just anything past what you don't know about. Okay, so, so uh, to just repeat it for YouTube, I guess. Hi, Mom. Yeah. So the, it's for, Stephen will allow a patch which adds things to the end of the string, but not Right. Yeah. Okay. And th that should be more than enough as well. And if anything happens to break in the output, then mm -hmm. we can we can update it. But uh, you know, if you go doing something like that, I would hope that you would notify me. <laughs> so d don't we have a JSON output for this? Uh, for, the t for the tests or no? Oh, for, or the for the TC for TC output okay. test for the test results. You no, mean? no, no. For oh. TC. No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. But th th there is just output for other things, right? There's some stuff. Yeah. Sh should be should be probably the best if you introduce JSON output to TC and then you just parse the JSON. Yeah, that would work probably but, very but well. But you as also well. need to to check the human readable reports. So it it may take a while to get all that completed. But yes, it will make a hell lot of sense because yeah. it's it's, uh, it's a, a formal uh, output, right? Which yeah. So is well defined. I don't see that being a problem to, to implement. But it's not ready, so. and we want to push this thing ASAP. So yeah. the other thing is, you're, you're doing these things on what? On containers, on hosts, or VMs? Right now, it's, it's strictly in containers. OK, now, to, to the stuff you've been, the, the, the test framework you have, or had, how I do mean, we fit into yeah. this? L LNST? Yes. Uh, I think that it, this can be uh, easily run with LNST altogether. I mean, uh, this is just for single host. LNST uh, is. Uh, used to multiple hosts. I mean, yeah. testing so, multi multiple hosts together. So you can actually run this from LNST. Okay, no so inside for a single host we run this, and then when we want no, no, to no, have no, 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 just you can have multiple hosts, single hosts. Doesn't really matter. You just run this uh, using LNST orchestration. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be a Maybe problem. we need to talk to you after this, but yeah. We, yeah. we'd like to start pushing some changes, some things in. Yep. Um, the big thing right now is uh, a lack should, of tests. Like Jamal, uh, Jamal has um, a yes. very significant library that I have, have to start going through. But if anyone has any other tests that they already use that they would like to submit for me, I would definitely appreciate it. So, so young Lucas is going to take all my tests and convert them into this. So I have, I have, I, I have accumulated tests over many years. Right? Some, Obscure features as well are in there, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, our time is up. I'm sorry for the people I cut, but uh, I almost feel like we need a whole day workshop. But because I had to cut other people before this, and I thank you all for for standing up there. And if you didn't speak, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah.